So, uh, good evening. I think we should get this show rolling. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. I'm David Woodland, and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for Keystone Symposia for Molecular and Cellular Biology. And I'd really like to welcome you for coming out on this snowy evening for this um, talk, which is a community forum, which is going to be on the viral threat in the age of Ebola. And it's brought to you, of course, by Keystone Symposia. I really want to start out by thanking Colorado Mountain College for letting us use this facility. We really appreciate that. And I also want to thank the Keystone staff that were instrumental in getting this going, particularly Yvonne Psyla and Mary Jo Roll, who uh, played a big role in organizing this. But there were lots of other staff uh, involved, too. So thank you to all of them. For those of you that don't know about Keystone Symposia, we're a not-for-profit organization who are based in Silverthorne. In fact, we're right above the first bank on that corner. Uh, our mission is to connect scientists and accelerate the pace of biomedical research. And to this end, we convene very high-level scientific conferences uh, all around the world. We typically organize around about 55 to 60 conferences every year. Uh, many of these meetings take place locally either in Keystone or in Breckenridge, uh, or sometimes in Steamboat Springs. We've actually, we've actually got one going on right now in Steamboat Springs. And um, we like to take the, some of the speakers from these meetings and bring them to you in these community forums to really give you a taste of the science and hopefully present the science to you in a, in a fashion that's understandable to an educated but lay audience. Currently in Breckenridge, we're hosting a meeting on viral immunity, and it's a really successful meeting. And it's brought together many of the world's leading virologists and immunologists. And therefore, it's really a, a pleasure to bring to you today two speakers from the conference who will talk to you about the latest developments in viral immunity research. And they are uh, John Udell and Heather Hickman. So John received his MD, PhD from uh, the University of Pennsylvania and spent several years as an assistant professor at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia. And then in 1987, he took a position as a senior investigator in the Laboratory of Viral Diseases at the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, part of the NIH, and subsequently became the, lab, the, the uh, chief of the cellular biology section of the Laboratory of Viral Diseases, and that's a position he still holds today. And John is actually the lead organizer for the meeting that's going on in Breckenridge right now. Uh, Heather Hickman received her PhD in microbiology and immunology from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And in 2004, she joined the Laboratory of Viral Diseases at the National Institutes of Health, where she's uh, currently a staff scientist. And she's also a speaker at the, the meeting that's going on in Breckenridge. So I really want to thank the speakers for their time, energy, and enthusiasm for doing this community forum. And, and what they're going to do today is present some key concepts about viral diseases. And we're going to follow that with a question and answer session, although John already tell, told me that uh, he'd be happy to take questions during his talk. Uh, but before we get to the presentations, they've asked me to do a little bit of a background introduction to uh, viral immunity. And so I'll just do that. And, and I think that uh, all of us in this room are very familiar with viral diseases. We've all been sick at various times with things like the flu or the measles or so on and so forth. Um, and many of you may be curious as to why it seems recently there has been an upsurge in new diseases. And of course, the granddaddy of them all in the last year was uh, uh, Ebola virus. And that's obviously something that's been of concern to a lot of people. But you may have noticed there's been quite a lot of activity in the virus area, a lot of new diseases that seem to have come onto the horizon. Uh, and I was just reading the New York Times today. There was an interesting article on enterovirus 68, which causes paralysis in some children. So, so it's almost as though something's going on. And yet, interestingly enough, we're coming out of an era where we have done uh, tremendous things to control viral infections. And I can just come around. Um, over the last century, maybe 150 years, there have been incredible advances in the control of viral diseases. 
Uh, for example, uh, we now have clean water, which uh, eliminates diseases, diarrheal diseases caused by viruses such as rotavirus. Insect management or vector control uh, has eliminated diseases like yellow fever, which used to be prevalent in the United States. Uh, we're able to isolate patients and uh, control uh, epidemics that way. Good healthcare means that people can survive infections that maybe were not survivable before, and this includes things like influenza. Vaccines have eliminated many of the diseases that perhaps many of us had as kids, but now there are good vaccines for many of those, uh, and so they're under control. There are, of course, antivirals, and the big thing is that we we're actually able to eliminate some diseases. So smallpox has been uh, completely eliminated from the planet. Nobody needs to suffer the dreadful disease of smallpox. And many diseases have been eradicated from the United States. And I mentioned yellow fever as, as just one example of that. So we've done this tremendous job. So why is there this apparent uptick in infectious diseases, uh, with Ebola being a prime example? And one of the reasons for this is something that we refer to as zoonosis, which is a transmission of pathogens, so that could be viruses, from animals to humans. Zoonosis just means transfer from animal to animal or animal to human. And here we've got a classical example of a zoonosis uh, in action. And it turns out there's a reservoir of viruses in the wild which uh, are able to apparently transfer to human, learn how to live in human, and can be very pathogenic and cause uh, disease. And this is a, uh, an interesting uh, figure which shows emerging or re-emerging diseases over the last 30 years. Basically, all of the red dots are newly emerging diseases, and all of the blue dots are re-emerging diseases, diseases that we knew about before but are suddenly getting much, much worse. And there are two things that I really want you to draw from this map. First of all, there are a lot of dots on this map, and this is just over the last 30 to 40 years. So there's a lot going on. Secondly, um, there's a lot of dots in the United States. Uh, no one should think that we're somehow immune from this process. In fact, the United States is a, is a hotspot for emerging disease. So, so this is something that's relevant to, to all of us. And I'm going to just touch very briefly on a number of these diseases. Ebola, which is present in Africa, uh, I've already mentioned. But other recent diseases that you might re recall are SARS, um, the bird flu, H5N1 influenza. You're familiar with HIV. Some of you may have heard about chikungunya virus, and if you haven't yet, you will do before too long. Uh, and then hantavirus, which you may or may not have, have heard about. And I'll just say a few words about each of these. So of course, Ebola virus has been in the news a lot because of this huge outbreak that's happened in West Africa. And it's decimated the countries of Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. And this is by far the biggest Ebola outbreak that's ever happened. And it's unusual for it to happen in West Africa. As of yesterday, the total number of cases is nearly 21,000 with over 8,000 deaths. And this is a, probably a classical zoonosis. Most of the evidence suggests that the virus lives happily in this creature called a fruit bat and is transferred into humans when humans eat this or somehow come in contact with, with bats. So these are pretty nasty, nasty looking things. And this, this uh, epidemic is finally coming under control, but you can see there have been an awful lot of deaths from this particular zoonosis. And there have been cases across Africa, but also in Europe and in the United States, typically because people with the disease are traveling to those countries. Another recently emerging disease that you probably remember is SARS. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And this was a virus that emerged in 2002 in Guangdong province in China and created a kind of local infection. No one knows exactly where it came from. It may have come from bats or there was some evidence for civet cats, but it's still, I think, a little bit unclear. And it would have remained a local infection except for one thing. There's a hotel in Hong Kong called the Hotel Metropole. And this is a hotel where lots of world travelers stay, uh, people that are traveling through Hong Kong, going throughout the world. And, an, and a businessman from Guangdong Pro province went to this hotel 
and he got a room on the ninth floor, this is this room, this green room, and got sick with SARS. They believe that he threw up <laughs> on the carpet and by the elevator, and consequently, all these people that are living in these blue rooms, or were staying in the blue rooms, became infected and then scattered across the globe and created a global infection and a global panic. You might remember that airline traffic was shut down extensively in certain areas, and there was a big outbreak in Toronto. But fortunately, this was a disease that was controllable by infection control, and we eventually eliminated it, but only after 774 deaths and over 8,000 cases. And just so you know, there's a very similar virus to this, which is circulating in the Middle East called MERS, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, and that's killing people right now, but it hasn't spread in the same way that SARS does. It's a very similar virus. And it comes uh, probably from bats and is transmitted from camels, through camels to humans. So it's a multiple animal transmission route. Chikungunya virus is a, another emerging virus that used to be common in Africa and parts of Asia, but suddenly has spread to other parts of the world, including Europe, and it's now all over the Caribbean and has spread onto uh, the northern part of South America. This is an interesting case. This particular virus was spread by a type of mosquito called Aedes aegypti, which is common in these areas and in parts of, uh, uh, of Asia. Uh, it mutated and learned how to live in another mosquito called Aedes albopictus, or the tiger mosquito, and that mosquito is much more widely spread, and consequently this disease is spreading. Before long, chikungunya virus will be prevalent in the United States. It's already reached Florida, uh, and it will probably spread. And it causes a flu-like disease, but in some patients it can be a, a, a very severe form of the disease. You may have heard of hantavirus. This actually wasn't long ago. In 2012, there was a hantavirus outbreak in Yosemite. Uh, this is a disease that's spread by mice. And what happens is the mice defecate, and uh, there's virus in the feces. That dries up, and then it turns into dust. And then people that are maybe staying in cabins uh, will end up breathing some of that dust and get this disease. And in that case, in, in this particular instant, there were eight cases and three deaths from this pretty severe pulmonary uh, infection. Uh, but this is a disease that is perhaps re-emerging. It was known to cause something called sweating sickness back in the days of Henry VIII. And then this is really a big one, but HIV is a brand new disease in humans. Uh, we're pretty confident that it originated in non-human primates in West Central Africa and was probably transferred to humans in the early 20th century. And once it got into humans and learned how to live in humans, it really uh, became unstoppable and has caused a pandemic across the whole globe. And up to date, it's estimated that AIDS, which is the disease caused by human immunodeficiency virus, has killed an estimated 40 million people worldwide. And then another disease that um, you may be thinking about is influenza, especially because right now we have a pretty severe influenza season. You probably know that influenza comes uh, every winter, and uh, we're now at about the severest time for, uh, for the influenza season. This is a map from uh, the 3rd of January showing severity of disease according to this heat scale, so red is the hottest. And you can see that most of the country right now is in the grips of a severe influenza uh, epidemic. And uh, it's already killed approximately 21 children. I don't know exactly if that's the latest data or not. And what you may not know about influenza is that it kills 20 to 40,000 people every year, usually the elderly, and, and, and what happens with influenza is it sets them up for uh, a pneumonia, and that's usually the, the, the thing that kills uh, people in the end. So there's a lot of new diseases out there. Things seem to be changing, uh, but there's a lot of reasons for optimism. First of all, I already mentioned that smallpox was eradicated. That was back in 1980. And although this isn't a human disease, rinderpest was just eradicated recently, about three years ago. Rinderpest is a disease of cloven-hoofed animals, cattle and so on, uh, and is a big problem in 
uh, low and middle income countries where they depend on cattle for food. So this is really a huge uh, uh, recent achievement. And polio will probably be eradicated in the near future. Uh, really, this is in the last throes of eradication. There are some hiccups in the process, but hopefully maybe in the next five years it will be gone. And the other thing to bear in mind is that there are a lot of new drugs and vaccines under development for all of these diseases. And, uh, and I think this is where I can really hand over to our speakers tonight because our two speakers are at the forefront of understanding these viral diseases, understanding how they make us ill, learning about how our immune systems fight them off, and uh, helping develop these drugs and vaccines that we're all going to need to protect us from these diseases. And so, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, uh, John Udell. John. Okay. Thanks, Woody. <coughs> Mike is working. You guys can hear me? Yeah. yeah. The lights are really weird. Uh, <coughs> I, I do encourage you to interrupt if, um, if you don't understand something. Uh, the point is to communicate um, information, and it's easier, more fun for me if you actually ask questions during. So, how do Woody? Where's the slide? Oh, here it is. Okay. That's the wrong one. That's the wrong one. Yeah. All right. Try the other one. Or maybe we should give each other's talk, Heather. <laughs> See how that goes. <laughs> challenge. Yeah, some of your Answer slides, the challenge. We'll do the double time. diamond here. Yeah. We're gonna do lake shoots as our talk. Hopefully, we don't fall off them. Got the whole universe. Take questions on the universe structure thereof, origin of matter, nature of time space continuum. Did it transfer? Is it still on the stick? I, I didn't bring it up. Did I bring it over? That's no. what he's. Recommend he's going to try this one. Okay. There, that's it. Okay. There we go. Okay, you want to sing along with me? We're off to see the wizard. <laughs> Wonderful wizard of Oz. Okay, so Ebola and bird flu and pox. Oh my. <laughs> okay, so why, why study viruses? That was a fantastic introduction, Woody. Uh, why study viruses? Well, the obvious answer is they, they cause diseases. And Woody just gave you 10 minutes on, on the diseases they cause. This is just a list, right? In addition to what Woody told you, there are hundreds of viruses out there that cause diseases we know about and thousands more probably. You, you think about the major medical problems that um, you face in America around the world, uh, most of these we don't know the cause of. You may think we know a lot more than we do about medicine, but take a disease you might have like rheumatoid arthritis or cancer or heart disease. You may think that doctors know everything about that, but we don't actually. We don't really know the causes of any of the major diseases except the infectious diseases. So in addition to the obvious things that we know about that are dangerous, that I'm going to talk about, there are probably many diseases out there that are caused by viruses. Okay, this is a key area of research is to figure out how pathogens are causing things we don't really know about. It's one of the, the key new topics brought up in the meeting, one of the best talks. To start the meeting, um, a virologist from St. Louis gave this talk telling us how if you're not infected with viruses, you don't develop a normal immune system. Whoa. You probably think viruses are just bad, right? They only do bad things, but no. We evolved with viruses. Our, our bodies are, um, are meant to deal with viruses, and if you take this important element away from us, our immune system doesn't develop normally, okay? So viruses are very cool and important things, cause lots of diseases. What everybody is really afraid of in the United States is that this guy, something like it, will come back. So this is the 1918 flu, which killed more people around the world by far, than World War I did, right? Um, the actual mor mortality rate was not terribly high. People think it's about one to 2%, but basically everybody in the world got this disease. And it was called the Spanish flu, mistakenly, because Spain was one of the few countries not at war. They had a relatively free press and they could publish stories about it. Uh, there was a tremendous repression of um, the press around the world during World War I. Uh, the disease probably started here. America had, I don't know, a half a million fatalities but they weren't allowed to talk about it because somehow it was against the patriotism of the World War I. That's what everyone's worried about, is we come back to a situation where 2% of the population dies. Okay, and obviously this, this can be made hysterical, right? 
So bird flu did not kill everybody. Uh, but all joking aside, even mild viruses, quote unquote, can kill. Uh, as Woody told you, seasonal flu kills tens of thousands in the USA each year. Uh, just to bring things in perspective, everyone was freaking out about Ebola. Ebola killed zero thousands of people in the United States. There was a single death from a person who had gotten Ebola in Africa and, and came back. Right? So despite this panic in the country, the, the um, procedures that um, were um, studied and, and uh, promulgated by the CDC, a government agency, I'm proud, I'll tell you, to work for the US government because we do lots of good things in this country. Uh, including study viruses and, and rate the right policies. These policies were in effect and they prevented an outbreak of Ebola in the US. Right? So the government actually sometimes can do good things. Even in Africa, Ebola will kill far less than other viruses. What he showed you, 40 million people have died from HIV. One million per year in Africa die from this virus still. So Ebola, a big problem, very scary, yes. Uh, but still, on uh, the public health scale of things, not a major player. Well, we hope we keep it this way. As what he said, it looks like the epidemic may now finally be under control. Why else study viruses? Uh, I am a basic scientist. I'm not really interested terribly in saving humanity, right? I am in science because I was driven by curiosity. Curiosity, it's a very important thing in science to have curious people who are just interested in how things work, who figure out um, <clears throat> mechanisms and pathogens for other people to then do practical things with. And the reason I was attracted to viruses is because they are excellent tools for studying nearly all aspects of how things actually work at the level of cells, which we're going to talk about, believe it or not. Uh, and they actually enable real-time studies of evolution. I, I do a lot of traveling. Uh, typically, when I'm on an airplane, I'm working on my slides, and people next to me, I try to engage them in science. And sometimes I'll sit next to someone who does not believe in evolution. Uh, in America, this is not uncommon, something like at least half the population does not believe in evolution. And I will tell them that in my lab, in one day, I can study the evolution of flu virus. Because I can take flu virus and grow it under a certain condition, and boom, out pops a new virus. And how do I know it's evolved? I'll tell you in a minute. OK, and they are excellent platforms for vaccines. So viruses are sort of cool. They cause disease, but they prevent disease. Okay? So you can use viruses against the virus itself and also against other viruses. Some of the most exciting new vaccines that are being made are viruses to treat cancer. Vaccines, excuse me, to treat cancer based on viruses, either to induce an immune response or actually to go into a person's body and kill the cancer cells, right? Where does all this come from? From basic knowledge about how viruses work. To use viruses as therapeutic tools, one has to understand their molecular mechanisms. What is a virus? Right? I bet some of you don't really know what a virus is. Okay, so here's a very famous definition from a Nobel Prize laureate. <laughs> Bad news wrapped in protein. It's very good, actually. Uh, my definition, if it's complicated, and then you have questions, please stop me. Obligate cellular parasite. That means it cannot divide on its own. It needs a host, you, to replicate. So that's the obligate, right? And it's a parasite. It can't bring anything itself. You have to eat food to feed the virus, basically. That uses you and your ribosomes, which, believe it or not, we'll also talk about, to, to produce its proteins. OK, just to get you in the right frame of mind, right? Powers of 10, very important for scientists. We think of things in terms of powers of 10. And because you're Americans, and I am too, money is always good. Right? We can understand money, right? So $10,000, 10 to the 4. Um, million dollars, 10 to the 6. Trillion dollars, about the size of the federal budget and deficit, 10 to the 12. Okay, so that's dollars. This is biology. Uh, do we have a pointer here, Woody? Which one is it, that? This one. So that's you, 2 meters. That's your liver, 200 millimeters, or like a guinea pig. Um, getting down to the size of a cell, we're at 20 microns. Right? So like seven orders of magnitude. And now here's a virus. It's a tiny little thing. Here's a bacteriophage. This is like a, a flu virus. Right? So they're very, very, very small. And you cannot see them even with a very fancy microscope like the kind that Heather is going to tell you about. You need an electron microscope to see them. They're very, very small things, remarkably small. What is a cell? A cell is the basic unit of all life. Everything on Earth is based on this amazing evolution of cells that somehow came out of this primordial muck that was the Earth four billion years ago. 
you made this this um, organism that um, is basically a, a bubble, a living bubble that can replicate itself. And through the miracle of evolution, over time, multicellular organisms eventually evolved, and then sooner or later we came out of this, right? That famous picture of the fish and then crawling out, turning into a man. So what are you? You are four by 10 to the 13th cells, okay? So take that trillion dollars, multiply it times 40, and that's how many cells make you or me. Okay, now this is very interesting. You are basically an excuse for your bacteria, right? Because there are um, probably 10 times as many bacteria as there are you. 2% of your body mass are bacteria, right? And it turns out, as I was saying before, these are actually a very important part of your biology, or all these bacteria that constitute you. Okay, so a cell is a membrane-bound vessel filled with protein machines and structures. And this is really important. How does a cell know to make another cell? The information has to be transferred from one generation to another. And I'm sure you all know this word DNA. If nothing else, you watch CSI, right? You know about the DNA evidence, right? So DNA, and so DNA is how the information is carried, and this is transcribed into another molecule called RNA, and then this is translated by ribosomes, amazing machines, into protein. Most important molecule is DNA. This is a molecule that can be perfectly copied. So you have a genetic information that is you inside each of your cell. When you need to make another cell, you can perfectly copy the instructions. An amazing thing, right? To tell the cell how to be. Um, and this enables a very simple coding mechanism. And the way the code works is very simple. This would have been solved uh, very simply in World War II. Uh, we have four different chemicals that make up the code. These are just the initials of the chemical. And then what happens is you copy the DNA perfectly. An A makes an A, a T makes a T, a G makes it right. You can copy this. Uh, and this makes the next cell or child, as the case may be. DNA makes RNA. The RNA has functions, structures, machines. And this is used also to transfer information. And you take this, uh, these three bases and you decode them. You read them three at a time and turn them into a protein. Proteins are strings of amino acids. There are 20 of these different amino acids. These are the building blocks of life. Okay, maybe, you've got, how do I get the movie to play? Do I have to click on it directly? This is my favorite thing in life. This is called a ribosome. Here we go. Just bear with me here. So this is a machine that you have in all your cells. Each of your cells has about 5 million of these things. Uh, this thing down here, this is the RNA. And the RNA is being processed through this machine. This is going at a rate of 5 amino acids per second. And out of the other end is coming out the proteins that make up you. You are essentially only proteins. And that's what we're going to get to with viruses. So ribosomes are amazing machines that are basically made out of RNA that take other kinds of RNA, take the information, and nearly perfectly convert these into proteins. Okay, we can stop that. I guess I can do that. That's a ribosome. And proteins are incredibly cool things. We know a lot about them now because we actually, using uh, very powerful machines, even though they are extremely tiny, we can solve their structures. We can know what they look like. This is an example of the many different proteins that exist in the world. Okay? People spent a lot of time doing this. A lot of your tax dollars went into figuring this out. And you need to know this information to need to know how life works. Right? These are all different kinds of proteins. Viruses are proteins, too. So I'm sorry for that diversion into how life works. But to understand what a virus is, you have to understand how they're made. And viruses are basically just proteins. Right? Proteins that evolution didn't make to make a human being, but that viruses made to make viruses. And often viruses are just a single protein or three or four proteins that combine to make these beautiful, beautiful structures. Right? So these are terrible things. It's sort of amazing that they're also beautiful, right? But they, they really are. So this is herpes virus up here, right? Which all of you, many of you have actually. It's a very common virus. This is a virus that causes diarrhea. This is another one that causes diarrhea. This causes warts. This is a, a, a virus that causes uterine cancer. Oh, all sorts of viruses. Here's polio virus, one of the small ones. They all have a characteristic structure, and they are made of proteins, and the proteins are made of ribosomes, and that's why the viruses have to infect you, right? Because they cannot make themselves unless they use your ribosomes. They are amazing things. You have three billion nucleotides that make up your DNA. Some viruses have a few thousand nucleotides that make up their uh, genetic structure, just a few thousand, right? And even though they're very simple, they could kill you, obviously, and they can change your behavior. 
rabies virus. Many of you are familiar with rabies viruses, right? right? Uh, rabies is in Colorado. Rabies virus, an incredible virus. You know, a tiny little thing, just a few thousand nucleotides. It is smart enough that when, when a rabbit dog bites you, or a wolf, or a raccoon, whatever you have out here, we have a lot of raccoons in Maryland, uh, the virus travels up your nerves, to your spinal cord, to your brain, and just when it's maximizing its replication in one of your salivary glands, it changes your behavior to make you bite other people. This tiny little thing can do that. Oh my God, they are absolutely amazing. And it's crazy, you know, I've been a virologist my whole scientific career. I know it sounds sick, but you, you, you actually, you respect them enormously to the point where you almost love them. It's crazy, right? <laughs> Very crazy, but it's really true. I really like viruses. I hope you could see that. Um, and now this, is, uh, this is just fun, right? So viruses are everywhere. You, take, you go to any beach, go to the Pacific Ocean, Gulf of Mexico, Atlantic Ocean, take a milliliter of seawater, take a really strong centrifuge so you can pellet the virus and then count it. There's three million viruses per milliliter of seawater. And then we can have fun with numbers, okay? So if you take all the oceans together, 10 to the 24th, that is a very big number of milliliters. Um, the ocean then has 10 to the 30 viruses in the ocean. So if you string these end to end, it's 10 million light years of viruses from the ocean. 10 million light years. That's the distance light travels in one year. Okay? So that the Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. Whoa. It, in weight, 75 million blue whales. Okay? So in the ocean, this is the most abundant form of life if, if viruses are alive. Is viruses. And this has a huge consequence because viruses killing the things they kill, which is mostly plankton, is responsible for most of the CO2 in the atmosphere. Just this cycle. Okay, this is one of the things that makes understanding global warming so difficult, is it's really complicated. But isn't this cool? And who would have ever thought of this? Right? And what this comes from is people just being curious about how viruses work and then just doing some calculations. Okay, and then making hypotheses and testing them. And then you find out something you absolutely need to know if you want to understand global warming, which is where most of the CO2 comes from. It's coming from viruses killing marine organisms. Amazing thing. Right? And who would have ever thought that you need to understand viruses to understand how the atmosphere works? But, but you do. Okay? So am I conveying how important basic research is? That's really what I'm trying to do. How curiosity drives amazing things. How you discover something and you never know what it's useful for. Okay, so I'll talk really about viruses. How do they replicate themselves? So all they care about, their only step in evolution, like ours actually, is reproducing. For a virus, that means from getting from you to the person next to you. If a virus doesn't do that, it doesn't exist anymore. So virus evolution is about transmission, right? So how do they transmit? Well, they have to get into a person. And they have to stick to the cell, they have to get inside the cell, and then take over the ribosomes and make more viruses. That's what they have to do. So there's another movie pulled off the internet this morning. Hope it plays. So this is a typical virus, a cartoon of a virus. That should play. There you go. Okay, and the man is speaking now, I think. Oh, you hit that. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to stop it. I'm sorry. No, it's gone. Okay, the guy is speaking. And the virus attaches to the cell. Okay, so viruses have proteins on their surface that stick to the cell. The cell gets confused. It thinks it's going to eat something. Instead, it eats the virus. The virus sticks to the cell. It has a way of merging its membranes with the cell membranes. The little bit of RNA or DNA gets into the cell, and then the virus goes about its business, which usually winds up killing the cell. Okay, part, part of the virus and getting out of the cell usually kills the cell, although there are many variations on this theme. Okay, a key aspect of the virus is its mutability. They have phenomenally high mutation rates, which is why I can demonstrate evolution in a single day. Viruses, in fact, uh, have a mutation rate that nearly kills them. And they do this to generate diversity. Basically, every virus in a population has a unique genome. Uh, and this, because they can change so easily, this poses a huge challenge for the immune system. The reason we don't have vaccines against flu or hepatitis C or HIV, the main reason is because how changeable the virus is. You make uh, an immune response to it, we'll get to that in a, in a second, and you can control the virus, but then it makes a mutant and it gets around the immune system. And this is why we don't have an effective flu vaccine. Just, just this simple fact. I've been studying this for 30 years. Looks simple, it is not. 
pathogenicity. That means how dangerous is a virus, right? And this is interesting because this is usually unrelated or inversely related to its transmissibility. A virus does not want to kill you, right? If it kills you before you can transmit it, it's dead. So what a virus wants to do is just be transmitted. And it has no opinion about whether you live or die, but better if you live because you can walk around transmitting the virus to other people. The reason that we don't have to worry too much about Ebola the way it is now is it is very, very hard to get Ebola from someone else. Okay? The virus is too pathogenic. People feel really sick. They're in the hospital bed. They don't move around. They can't get it around. Okay? The most successful viruses cause very little pathogenicity. Probably on average you have four different kinds of herpes viruses in you, and unless you get immunosuppressed, it's no problem. And in fact, as I was telling you before, it may be even an advantage to have these herpes virus infections. Uh, all of you have papillomaviruses. These are viruses that can cause skin cancer. But you all have them, and typically they don't do anything. Uh, I can tell your genetic origins by uh, sequencing your papillomavirus. That's how specific they are. The only exception to what I'm telling you is this horrible disease known as smallpox. Smallpox was both highly transmissible and highly lethal, 30 to 50%. This is the one virus that has been eradicated from human populations. Okay, so I, I, I hope I have convinced you that viruses are dangerous and ubiquitous foes. Uh, and 400 million years is a long time, right? So in evolution, then, we've had a long time to develop defenses against virus. And, and in fact, viruses have probably been around right from the beginning of life. And so working in you are mechanisms that were first developed billions of years ago when cells were first evolving. As cells evolve, they evolve viral defense mechanisms. And we have very many levels of defense. Um, we have something called the innate immune system versus the adaptive immune system. Innate immunity means that you have something working all the time and being exposed to the virus doesn't matter. Okay, and this is the main thing that keeps you alive, actually, is the innate immune system. The adaptive immune system, Heather will speak about the T cell element of this. I'll tell you a little bit about the antibody element of this. This is what vaccines do. They induce the adaptive immune system. Uh, innate immunity, the, the simplest part of the immune system, the most important is something you take uh, for granted and ignore every day, which is just your skin. Okay? Most important part of the immune system, your skin. Take away your skin, you're dead in a few hours. I had my, one of my few patients as a medical student who died was a guy who was in a fire, an alcoholic guy who was in an apartment fire in Philadelphia. I never forget taking him to the hospital and just watching his skin peel off. Right? And he was dead within a few hours. Uh, if nothing else, you're going to get massive infection. So skin, a very important part of the immune system, just preventing bugs from getting into you. Uh, the humoral, humoral just means it's something that floats around in your blood. There are proteins, special proteins, and other substances in your blood that have antiviral activity that we're just really learning about now. There's the cellular element. These are cells. Uh, first of all, there's every cell in your body innately senses viral infections and makes an antiviral response. This is work that just has become clear in the last 10 years. Right? That we can ignore. Uh, and then we have sort of professional cells. You have parts of your immune system that are always there to protect you. And Heather will show you some of these, right? The macrophages? Yeah. Some of these are called natural killer cells. There's other things called macrophages, granulocytes. Okay, and then we have the other part of the immune system that vaccines are aimed for called the adaptive or lymphocyte immunity. I'm going to talk about antibodies. These are very important in vaccines. Uh, they're uh, absolutely key for the way most vaccines work. Um, and it's so important that um, my institute uses this for the logo, sort of a model of an antibody. How do they work? Well, um, here's flu virus. OK, this is a beautiful EM picture of flu virus. This is the actual EM picture. And this is what a computer can make of this these days. Uh, you can have an electron microscope and actually can section the virus and we can put it together in a three-dimensional reconstruction. And Heather will show some of these with cells. So this is sort of a view of flu virus. And this is a uh, flu virus. Um, uh, do I have that? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I thought I had another picture. So you see these spikes, right? These green spikes, right? This is the protein that attaches the virus to the cell. This is one of those spikes. And here's the spike here, and these are antibodies that are stuck to it. Okay, and you can see these from the EM. If you look really hard, you can see little things stuck on the virus. 
So we have tremendous information now how actually these antibodies work. And the way they work is they stick to the virus and they prevent the virus from, from binding to your cell. Okay? So they protect you. Okay, so the most practical message from this talk, and I'm almost done, is that vaccines save lives. You and your family members should get all recommended vaccines. All recommended vaccines. There's a, um, a lot of misinformation out there on the web uh, saying how vaccines are dangerous. They are not. Vaccines have saved more lives than all other medical interventions combined in the history of medicine. Combined. Okay, vaccines have been a key element in medicine. It was the first part of medicine, other than surgery, that actually helped people and didn't kill them. Uh, the first vaccine was developed in the late 1700s by a guy named Edward Jenner. And this was the vaccine that was eventually used to eradicate smallpox. This was a terrible, terrible disease. In the uh, 20th century alone, this killed probably 400 million people. Okay, and this was eradicated with this vaccine. Vaccines work. Uh, vaccination, nothing is perfectly safe in this world, nothing. Right? Everything has a risk-benefit, everything. Uh, vaccines have by far the best therapeutic index of all modern medicines. Do they have side effects? Yes, they do. Compared to what? Right? Compared to every other medicine, including aspirin, Tylenol, anything you would take, vaccines are much safer with much fewer side effects, with much better um, uh, outcomes as well. Uh, this is a constant battle against anti-science activists. These are very well-meaning people. These are not evil people but they are killing children right, and adults by their activities, by convincing people that vaccines are harmful. This is bad. Get vaccinated, okay? Get vaccinated. Take every vaccine that is recommended for you. There is no evidence they are harmful. There, all the evidence is they are beneficial. Okay, so I will leave you to read this, The Case for Science by Richard Dawkins. Okay, do you, what, do you want me to take questions now or do you want to wait? Okay, yeah, excellent. Okay, well, John gave you uh, a great talk about what viruses are, but I thought it might be interesting for you to see sort of what a viral immunologist does on a daily basis. So I've been studying viruses for I mean, almost 20 years now. I work with viruses every single day. I would tell you that I don't work with them on the weekends, but I have a five-year-old that just started kindergarten. So uh, <laughs> we've seen them a lot this year. Um, so um, one of the things that scientists really like to do is we try to take things that are common um, in everyday life and use them to solve problems that we don't understand. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today. So um, I think if you were to look at a stereotypical picture of a scientist, you would see someone looking through a microscope. And we use microscopes a lot to try to understand what's going on at um, better detail. And so... Uh, okay, and so, um, you know, if... Most of you probably weren't like me, but I can remember my dad bringing home a microscope when I was little, and we would basically take everything we could find and stick it on a slide. And we didn't see it at very high magnification, but you know, we looked at things from the creek, and we looked at ants, a lot of ants. And uh, um, anyway, you might be familiar with some of these images that you could see at higher resolution. So this is some money. Um, this you might find in pond water, and this is actually a flea. So um, we use microscopes to sort of understand things in our life, but of course, um, you know, this isn't high enough resolution that we could actually see viruses, but wouldn't it be great if we could actually see what was going on when people were infected with viruses? And so um, we get a lot of information when we look through a microscope, but we can't see everything. So John talked to you about a cell and the structures inside the cell that do specific things to help the cells survive, to help the cells get energy and survive. Um, and if we look through just a light microscope, sort of the things that you could go and get and, and you could take home and play around with, which I encourage you to do, you can see some really interesting things. Um, you can't see all of the things you might really be interested in looking at. And so um, these are just cells and you can see a couple of structures using um, just plain light microscopy. So these are the cell walls, and this would be the nucleus of the cell. 
And that really houses the genetic information, so that's where the DNA is stored, so that you can pass that on to um, daughter cells. So um, we can take this and we can try to understand how viruses work in people by taking a look at what's actually going on. Um, but you can imagine we can't stick a whole person under a microscope and see what's going on. So the way that um, doctors usually do this is that they take biopsies. So they'll use a needle to remove a small part of an organ and then they send that to a pathologist and that can give us a pretty good idea of a disease state that might be happening. So this is actually a section of a liver from someone that's been infected with hepatitis C virus. So we can get an idea of what the virus does to a person by taking this sort of snapshot image and using the microscope to help us understand what's going on in the tissue. But um, one of the things doing basic science that we would like to do is, is really better understand how viruses are interacting with the immune system and if we could even track that in real time. And so to do that, we need a more sophisticated microscope than just a simple light microscope. And also we need model systems because obviously you can't do this in people. And so this is a fancy microscope we have in the lab. Um, and it takes advantage of a principle called fluorescence. Fluorescence is something that you are probably all familiar with, especially if you tune into CSI. And uh, you know, it's a principle that's active in a lot of the everyday items. And so you're familiar with neon shirts might be fluorescent or glow in the dark things, and these all work in um, similar principles. So just to tell you a little bit about what um, fluorescence is in just a few words, fluorescence is um, it's a property of a, a, a chemical or an object that lets it absorb light. And so it can absorb uh, a photon of light and then what happens is it also emits light. And typically, the light that it emits is um, a longer wavelength or has less energy than what it absorbs. But the practical feature is it looks like it's glowing, so it's giving off a light. And we can collect these, and we can take a look at different things by collecting um, different fluorescent chemicals. So if we take a look at cells now applying the principles of fluorescence, we can stain different structures inside the cells. So here you see the first picture that I showed you just looking using light to illuminate a cell. But if we use fluorescence, we can label different structures inside that same cell. So here you can see the nucleus is in blue. And in this case, we can see mitochondria labeled around um, the nuclei. And the mitochondria are really the powerhouses of the cell. So um, not to spend too much time dwelling on this, but you can see how it adds an additional layer of information on what we're trying to understand. So one of the cool things that's happened since I've been doing science is we've um, evolved from having a very few uh, labels of fluorescence to now we can really cover the whole rainbow in different colors of fluorescence and we can use these to try to understand viruses. So um, John, mentioned briefly smallpox, and smallpox is one of the viruses that we try to understand in the lab. Um, one of the reasons for this is because this was a very successful human vaccine. But when the vaccine um, was put into people, we had no idea how it works. We just know that it works. So we need to understand some of the principles behind how this vaccine works so that we can apply it moving forward to some of the other things that happen in our lives. So I'll just tell you a little bit about smallpox. Um, Smallpox has been around for a really long time. We can find evidence of it um, even in the pharaohs. So this is a, a mummy of the pharaoh, and if you were to look really close on Pharaoh Ramsey's face, you can see pox marks. So he probably had smallpox. Um, it was an airborne virus that was easily transmitted. It caused a severe rash. And even as late as the late 1960s, it killed a large amount of people around the world. And since then, it's been eradicated. So uh, we study not smallpox in the lab, but we study the vaccine to smallpox, which is vaccinia virus. Um, many of you probably had this vaccination. Everyone that works in the lab has this vaccination. And um, vaccinia virus is inoculated into your skin using a bifurcated needle. It replicates in the skin. 
And so um, what we wanted to ask is, could we use this every common, everyday common thing, fluorescence, can we use it to now help us better understand how vaccinia virus works? And can we, can we really track what's happening with both viruses and your immune system? So um, one of the first things that we can do, I'll tell you, is we can make vaccinia virus different colors. So we can make um, green, green viruses, blue viruses, red viruses. So we basically can, can um, cover most of the spectrum of different colors of vaccinia virus. And if you look at vaccinia virus infected cells, they're really quite beautiful. So here you can see these little red dots are actually vaccinia virus. And vaccinia, uh, as all viruses, uses the cell to grow and to replicate, and it uses parts of the cell to um, transmit from cell to cell. So it actually uses a structure called microtubules. And the uh, vaccinia, the baby viruses, will assemble on the microtubules and spread from cell to cell. This is just in case any of you are interested in a new <laughs> iPhone cover. <laughs> Uh, the government is not telling this. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no proceeds will go towards a college education of a kindergartner. <laughs> but they actually are really quite beautiful. So here's a movie of vaccinia virus, and um, it's just going through. You're going to see how the virus uh, moves around in a cell, and it uses uh, structures of the cell to help move. So isn't that neat? When we get to look at this and we get to see this every day, it's a really fun job. Okay, so we can look um, at just cells in a dish and we can see how the viruses move around in the cells, but we can also look at um, animals. So this is using um, actually not fluorescence, but a closely related process called bioluminescence. And we can see if you infect with a virus, um, this, is, this is work done not by me, but by someone else in the laboratory of viral diseases. You can see how a virus might spread within an animal. So um, in, in our lab, we really ask how we can use um, fluorescence and the fluorescent vaccinia viruses that I just showed you to see what's happening. So this is a, a normal arm that's been inoculated with vaccinia virus. Um, vaccinia vaccination is actually a live virus, unlike the vaccinations that we receive for most other things. And vaccinia forms a little um, pustule or pox in the skin that eventually scabs over and is cleared. So what does this look like if we, if we can track the immune system and we can track um, the virus? So this is actually um, vaccinia virus infection of mouse skin. So we can use these um, really cool properties of fluorescent viruses to look at this. So you can see the skin here in blue. So the fancy microscope that we have actually lets us see different aspects of the skin. Um, and, and this is vaccinia virus as it's spreading through mouse skin. So when the virus first gets inoculated into the skin, it's in a relatively confined site where the needle actually pokes into the skin. And then it starts spreading outward from cell to cell. So here we can actually see the older viruses in red. And sort of as they're making babies and infecting new cells, it's spreading out. So this is what you would actually see in the arm if the virus was fluorescent. Um, and then we can, since we can see the virus, we can also see parts of the immune system, which is really cool. So this is an uninfected mouse skin. And what you actually have is, as John said, you have some um, both innate and adaptive immune responses. And part of the innate immune response is it's always there and it's always searching to find something that's infecting you so that it can react. And so you have a type of cells in your body called neutrophils. They make up a very large percentage of the blood. So um, if you've ever had your blood taken and they do your cell counts, this is what they're looking for because some of your cell counts go up or down depending on if you're infected. So this is just uninfected skin. And these are actually your neutrophils moving through a blood vessel. This happens to be in a, in a mouse. And so this particular mouse has green neutrophils. And these slowly crawling cells are also members of the innate immune response. And these are called um, tissue macrophages. And if they encounter a virus, they will gobble it up and they will respond to virus infection. So we can see viruses and we can see the immune response. What happens when we put the two together? 
So this is vaccinia virus infected skin. This time we've used a red um, vaccinia virus. And these are those same neutrophils that were moving through the blood vessels. But this is what happens at the site of vaccination. So you can see these guys are rapidly coming out of the blood vessels and they coalesce into these swarms and they work together to try to clear the viral infection. So that's what happens in your skin. Um, so you can imagine that if you are a virus, you might try to get away from the immune response because your whole job is to try to get out there and infect someone else. So um, this image shows you this would be the big site of replication of vaccinia virus and then outside that you have a number of cells that are moving around so these cells might be trying to escape um, this is just a higher magnification version of this so all of these are virus infected cells so the virus makes the cells turn green because we um, designed the virus to be that way so um, what you can't see in this image are all the other cells that aren't infected with virus that are there trying to um, clear things up. So when you have these infected cells trying to get away, you also have the immune response trying to catch up with it. And so to really look at that, we um, wanted to look at T cells. So we have a mouse that has red T cells and also has these light blue T cells. So we can put those in and take a look and see how the T cells respond to the virus infected cells. And we can actually see the T cells chasing the virus infected cells around. So it's pretty cool and all this is going on in your skin and you have no idea that your immune system is working so hard. All you know is you don't feel good because you're spending a lot of energy. So this is um, just the last movie that I'm going to show you today. This is actually a T cell in red. And when it catches up with a virus infected cell, it kills it and breaks it apart into little pieces. So this is your immune system really working to clear virus infected cells over the course of infection. You'll have thousands and thousands of T cells come in. Antibodies also play an important role um, for, for our viruses. And these all work in concert to help get rid of the virus in your body. Um, so how are we going to use this sort of technology moving forward? Um, you know, what we really are interested in is just to try to increase our understanding of how viruses in the immune system work and how the immune system really functions to um, clear out virus infection so that we can um, better understand how to fight even new viruses that come up in the future. So, um, you know, it's interesting to speculate that in the future we may be able to instead of using our small models um, of animals, you know, maybe we can take this into some forms of non-invasive imaging. And I've been at some sort of think tank meetings where people are trying to apply this to humans. And, and we can visualize some things in people like lymph flow. So you can see your um, lymph nodes and the, and the fluids flowing that are really important. We haven't gotten it to the level of viruses yet. But, you know, an ultimate goal would be to come up with better approaches uh, and even personalized approaches to combating virus infection. All right, and that's all I have to say today on this. Okay, that was fantastic. Um, I'd like to invite Heather and John to uh, come up to the front. And there's a microphone that should be available and, and for people that have questions. And uh, all three of us will be happy to take questions. Is there a microphone? Because okay. are they taping it? What's a microphone somewhere? Oh. Yeah, okay. Just so stand up. What's the mechanism for the virus uh, mutating so much? Uh, the mechanism is that every life form has a way of copying the nucleic acid. Uh, and the virus's uh, mechanism of copying is deliberately imperfect. So it makes random mistakes on purpose. Okay, so perfection is not possible in, in biology. But you get really, really close with the um, enzyme called the polymerase that copies your DNA. And it's got two ways of being very accurate. First, it's very accurate intrinsically. And second, when it makes a mistake, it knows it's made a mistake and it can fix it. 
Okay, viruses want to make mistakes. So they have no proofreading mechanism. Okay, so a virus will make a mistake every thousand times it copies one of its um, uh, nucleotides. So every time it makes a new genome, it makes mistakes. And you have children, one or two, maybe, if you're average, you have 2.2 children. Interesting 2.4. 2.4. It's interesting what a point four is. Maybe I have one of those. Uh, uh, but viruses have thousands of children, okay? So we have very few children, we mammal, and we put a lot of energy into making sure they're right, okay? Viruses have the opposite strategy. They have lots and lots of children, and they want to make as much diversity as possible. And not just to escape the immune system, but uh, for, other, uh, for other reasons. Their evolution, as simple as they are, is incredibly complicated. And I should have mentioned this in our talk, but the, the sequencing has gotten to the point now where uh, when, I, when I was a PhD student, one of my most important papers was a collaboration where we sequenced influenza virus. Uh, I selected mutations in the lab with antibodies to show how the antibodies were working, and another lab in England sequenced them. It took a very good person two years to sequence 40 little regions of the virus. Overnight now, for a few dollars per sample, we can sequence hundreds of viruses and get the answer the next day. Okay, when I saw I was saying, I can see evolution in real time. We really can with viruses. And so they're very, very good tools now for understanding how evolution works. And then also, practically, for understanding how flu avoids the immune system, or HIV. Okay, so that was a very, very good question. Yeah. It's, very, it's hard to know. And I'm sure the audience is diverse in, in what your background is as well. But it was, it's very hard for us to know at what level to present things. So we're all sorry. I'll speak for Woody and Heather. If we, we didn't give you enough information or if we gave you too much. Okay, after my talk, I'm thinking, oh, Christ, I don't think anybody understood anything. But <laughs> I'm sorry, okay? It's very hard. Yeah. Are there any indications that viruses can communicate? Oh, boy, that's another good question. Yeah. We, have a, we just had a paper, an excellent question, uh, like a swarm, right, like bacteria, yeah. So we just had a paper published uh, last month in a, in a good journal, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, where a, a fantastic postdoc in our lab, Chris Brook, who's at the meeting, presented a poster last night, a lot of, a lot of attention, and Chris has shown that flu actually depends on communication between viruses. Because flu is a bit unusual. It doesn't just have one piece of nucleic acid. It has eight, eight little segments, each that makes a protein or two. And what Chris showed quite elegantly is that the virus deliberately doesn't get all eight. It very often gets seven. And one of the things we're thinking, one of our hypotheses is, this makes the viruses work together. And it allows them, it forces them to share genetic information. Okay? So in a system like a flu virus or other viruses, there's very good evidence that they are not working as individual viruses but as populations of viruses. They're working really as an army, and they depend on each other to achieve their aims. Okay? Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, but you know, so what's really cool is the parallels between real viruses and computer viruses. Right? They're amazingly similar to the point where computer virus people study the immune system to try to figure out how to protect your computer. Because it's basically the same problem. You got something very small, very nimble that can be changed very quickly, working on something very slow and reasonably stupid, which is your computer, <laughs> right? That, and so the computer to protect itself then has to have a fast element as well, right? So the parallels are striking, and all of this in the end then tells us a lot about information transfer, and it gets to the heart of what knowledge is as well, right? Because the philosophically, if you think what is knowledge, at the end of the day, it's just information. And then transmitting it is essential, which is communication. And who does this better than anybody? Viruses. Okay? Viruses. Uh, the uh, virus dies out if it cannot infect. So it needs to bore into the cell. I haven't heard much about the analysis, the science that's known at this time about the doors on cells. Can you close that door? Temporarily for a while, so the, the virus is going to die out. Uh, yeah, well, you want them to die out, though, right? 
You're not, you're not Dr. Evil, are you, by, by any chance? <laughs> yeah. No, you want them to die out. And so, I ask my kids. Yeah, okay, so there's two ways to make them, prevent them from getting in cells. One way is get a vaccine. And then you make antibodies that prevent them from getting into cells. That's how most vaccines work, as far as we understand. The second way, where that doesn't work, like with HIV, where we don't have a good vaccine, you try to make a drug, a small molecule, that because we know a lot about how the proteins work, I showed you those beautiful structures. What you can do with those structures now is design molecules, drugs, that prevent them from working. You've got these very fine structures. You actually can take uh, chemicals and design them to fit in certain pockets, uh, say in the HIV protein or the part of the cell that it binds to, and make a substance that will then prevent the virus from working. Okay, so that's how you can prevent entry. So far, I don't think there's a drug that does that, that's licensed, but the antivirals that are out there work by blocking um, other viral proteins and particularly the polymerases. And so the HIV drugs that have been developed through a lot of basic science, right, starting with some other organisms completely unrelated, uh, these are working molecularly by preventing these polymerases from working or from other proteins from working in the viruses. Okay, and I just want to emphasize how important the basic research element of this is. People got interested in viruses before they were medically interested in them. They were just interested in understanding how they worked. And because of all of that, many elements of modern biotechnology were developed, like DNA sequencing, like gene moving around, right? Genetic engineering. And um, if this basic research hadn't been done, and there was enormous criticism at the time that the government was spending all this money just to, to humor scientists and entertain them. If, if they weren't entertained, when HIV came around in the early 1980s, we would have no clue what was killing people, no clue whatsoever. And if people had blocked genetic engineering research in the 70s, okay, which was a very real possibility, people were worried we were going to destroy the world by genetic engineering. If that had happened, when these viruses had come along then, 10, 20, Ebola, 30 years later, we would have no idea what was killing us. Knowledge is power. The more we know, the more we can do. Is science perfect all the time? Of course not. Is it possible to do evil with science? Yes, it is. It's a balance one has to achieve. And uh, it, for, you know, for of all the things we do in the world as a society, science has by far had the greatest benefit to the lives of human beings materially uh, and, and health-wise. Science, basic science, leading to very practical things. You said that 2% of our body mass was, back, uh, was uh, viruses? Well, mine, anyway. Yeah, yes. okay. Yours, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> and I forget how many. But not virus, bacteria. Pardon bacteria. Me? Bacteria. Just bacteria. Bacteria. So, how many different bacteria does that actually represent in the body? Okay. Ten, tens uh, of millions? What is it? Many millions. Yeah. yeah. And, and what's cool now, uh, Skip Virgin is at the meeting, gave the keynote talk. And Skip now studies the viruses that infect those bacteria, because they have their own viruses. And it turns out you have a, a, a whole world of those viruses that are very important for health. Yeah, I, I don't have a microphone, so I'm going to come and talk here. But um, th there's a whole new field that's developing, and that is to understand all of those bacteria that actually live within your body and on your skin. And it's turning out that these bacteria don't just sit there and eat stuff. They actually have big impacts on, on how your body works. And there's even evidence now that it, they may have psychotic effects. They may affect the way that you think as well. Um, so so these are, this is a very important area. And uh, you know, one of the things is there are more bacteria cells in your body than your own cells. But they don't take up, up as much mass because they're much smaller than your own cells. So there's more of them, but they're smaller, and so they represent, and I think you said 2% of, uh, of the and body mass. Many of you have heard about fecal transplants, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fairly disgusting concept, but very important for certain. It looks like it really works quite well for certain diseases. Well, one, one of the things that can happen is that the bacteria get out of balance, and, and the array of bacteria that are present in the gut 
can be what you might call abnormal, and then this can cause a disease state. And so if you can fix that, if you can send those, get those bacteria back into their normal um, sort of uh, arrangement, then, then you can cure the disease. And that's where fecal transplants come in. But the interesting thing is, these bacteria are constantly attacked by viruses. So there's a whole world war going on in your bodies the whole time. And I think one of the things that uh, John touched on that I think is really important is, you know, we're talking about viruses here that attack us and make us ill, because obviously that's really important to us. But viruses attack all sorts of cells, and one of the types of cells they attack are bacteria, and of course that can influence us. Uh, if you are a manufacturer producing something like lactic acid and you're using bacteria to produce those lactic acid, there are viruses that can wipe out your culture. So you have these big vats making uh, this product for you and the whole thing just goes dead because a, a virus gets in there and destroys it. And John also mentioned that uh, viruses are uh, present in seawater at tremendous concentrations. They're also present in uh, soil killing bacteria in the soil. So we're talking about an extremely complex system uh, that's constantly battling the whole time. You should mention that the next um, lecture is on March 3rd and it's all in microbiome, that very topic. Yeah, just to... Uh, Build on your comment, there's a constant war going on between bacteria and viruses in nature. Uh, is there any indication that you can find a bacterium that can actually kill a virus and use it as an antiviral? You know, it's my understanding that I guess there's... The other way, for sure. And uh, this was something a therapy developed in the 20s. Anybody read Aerosmith, a book by Sinclair Lewis? Uh, it was based on the idea that you could treat bacterial infections before their antibiotics with viruses. And it actually works. And the Russians kept doing that. I think they still have products. And people now are trying to develop, because it's because of the, uh, the antibiotic resistance, people, there's renewed interest in developing viruses that can fight bacterial infections. But are there substances released by bacteria that can fight viruses? That's a very, very uh, insightful question. The answer is yes. Um, there are many natural substances of bacteria that affect how cells work. And many of those will block viral infections. Uh, the problem with targeting viruses that way is you target the cells, right? So it's a, it's a pyrrhic victory. You can kill, you can prevent the virus from working, but then you kill your cell, okay? So that's why most of the drugs these days are targeted uh, to try to develop viral targets. And um, the bacteria that would be a potential source of these, they're not going to produce substances against the viruses that affect us. Viruses are typically highly species specific. There are some viruses that cross species, what he talked about these, those are not very common. Most viruses are extremely specific for their host. This actually is a difficulty as a, as a virologist, you'd like to understand how hepatitis B or C viruses work, they don't work in any other animals except for chimpanzees and gorillas. So um, that's an excellent question. And you know, the real answer to your question is almost certainly if, if you made a, a hard enough effort, you would find molecules like that. Because yeah, nature is just uh, amazingly complicated and cool. If you look hard enough for something, you almost always find it if you're clever. There was a world map that you showed that uh, had the locations of the various viral outbreaks. It seemed like above a certain latitude there were no outbreaks. Is that lack of data? Is that a coincidence? Or is there something else going on there? Lack of people? <laughs> <laughs> Greenland doesn't have a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more to do. I, I, there are a couple of things that uh, are important about that map. One is that um, in some areas of the world there's much better disease surveillance that goes on, and so there's much more awareness of, of things that might be happening. So certainly in Europe and in North America and certain other countries, that, that's true, whereas countries in Africa might have poorer health surveillance and, and not recognize certain things. But I, I, I think John hit the answer to your question. Um, uh, part of it is due to how populated certain areas are.
Does that does that answer your question? But the uh, insect-borne uh, viruses, of which there are many and many emerging ones, these are going to be where mosquitoes are, and then there's a certain latitude, although that's moving now with a global climate change, uh, a certain latitude that's going to restrict the disease. And th this is one of the things. Uh, the reason there are more outbreaks of what used to be tropical diseases uh, is probably because the climate is warming and the range of the mosquitoes is increasing. So this is one of the consequences of global climate change, probably. We'll, get, well, we'll let her, she's got the mic. Let her ask first, and then we'll get the mic to you. Yeah. I hope this isn't too simplistic. Uh, my understanding about the flu vaccine, the annual flu vaccine, is that it's protective against a certain number of strains, and that scientists, I guess, in your office make some kind of prediction annually about which strains are going to be prevalent. And I've always been curious about how that prediction gets made? Well, that's another good question. Yeah. Um, so um, very good. You're very knowledgeable. The, the, it does not have to be a perfect match to work. OK? The virus is not great, but it's, it, even if it's a partial match, there will be some protection. Uh, it's basically a guess. Uh, they look at the southern hemisphere and what viruses are, are prevalent, and they assume that that will be the major strain that's affecting uh, the northern hemisphere. Um, and, and that's every year, that's basically how they have to do it. And it's basically an intelligent guess. Uh, there have been many, many efforts over the decades to try to make a system in the lab where we can predict which way the virus will go. And to date, that has not been successful. Um, the flu virus has a prodigious ability to change itself, prodigious. Um, as I said, we can select mutants in, in one day. We take a single antibody, sometimes we'll get 10 different mutants that escape the antibody. So the, the virus is a very, very cool thing. It's got uh, an amazing ability, a uh, chameleon-like ability to change itself. Yeah, and, and actually just, just to your point about the veterinary vaccines, and, and mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to it either, um, and it may be something to do with the way the vaccines are made, and, and maybe there's some level of overkill there too, because um, uh, it may be just a sort of general practice, but it may actually be overkill. Um, but we could get the answer to that, because next week we have a meeting in Keystone, which is on veterinary immunity, and uh, there'll be some of the world's experts on veterinary vaccines there, and we can ask them that very question and get an answer. Or just to hang that. out in the lobby. <laughs> hey, come here. So if, you, if you hang out for a week or so, we'll get you the answer. Yeah. Anyway, I, it's, it's uh, past 9 o'clock, so I'd like to call this to a close. I just want to thank our speakers for some absolutely excellent presentations. <laughs> and I... And I want to thank all of you for, for coming. Uh, there were some really wonderful questions today. That's, it's, um, it's really great to do these things because there's so much interest from the community. And, and let me thank again CMC for hosting this event for us and all the Keystone Symposia staff that worked to put this on. Thank you all very much. <laughs>